this is, and you're all welcome to episode 93, which might well turn out to be the most prudent of the episodes we've ever had. And I can only attest to, G to uh, Julia's genius in scheduling the subject matter for this evening at nine o'clock Israel time being bombarded in real time. Uh, this is almost too much to believe. Uh, this is the kind of thing that volunteers for Israel volunteers would normally jump at and be on an airplane uh, within the hour. So, Julia, will you introduce our speaker? Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to welcome you on on this very special and uh, very difficult presentation during very difficult time indeed. I mean, we just... Uh, we just had that feeling of, oh, we are done with the COVID-19 and then we have to deal with something uh, which is even more threatening for me personally. Somehow I felt safe during the COVID-19 pandemic and I do not feel so now, uh, not at all. And uh, I wish uh, it was not this coincidence that we have this presentation during this period of time. I wish we had just a, a normal, boring evening uh, listening to Lauren, but we, we do not. Uh, and I'm not sure who is to blame for it. Anyhow, I'm happy and privileged to introduce Lauren Isaacs, the National Director of Chirut, Canada, broadcasting here from Jerusalem. And Lauren, it's all yours. And thank you so much for joining us during this difficult time. Thank you so much, guys, for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, if you have any questions, by the way, uh, I'll answer questions afterwards about the presentation or about what's going on in Israel right now, because I know it's a, a very serious situation and a lot of people are unsure about what's really going on in the ground, especially since the media is portraying it completely uh, you know, not true. So feel free to ask any questions. This presentation in particular is about the Jewish people's legal rights to the land of Israel. So let's jump right in. So basically, when I'm on university campuses or in high schools, people often know how to defend Israel biblically or religiously. And often they know how to defend it morally because our moral claim is very strong to the land of Israel. Now we own the land of Israel. When I say we, I mean the Jewish people. I don't know the demographic of people actually on this call, but when I say we, I'm, I'm Jewish and I'm speaking for uh, Jewish people. We own the land of Israel legally, biblically, ethically, religiously, morally, historically, de facto, militarily. We own it in every way, and we can touch a little bit on these things, but tonight in particular, we're going to talk about the legalities because people don't know them. We don't get taught this stuff in school, and we have to know how to defend it. When people say Israel is breaking international law, Israel is in violation of international law, that's not true, and I'm going to show you why. So here we go. First of all, this is a map of biblical Israel. So this is, is what we call greater Israel. When we're talking about biblical Israel, this is our ancient land, our ancient homeland. For thousands and thousands of years, this is nothing new. Zionism is not new. Judaism is not new. This is a 5,000 year old movement. So when people say, oh, Zionism is political, it's a new thing. It started with Theodore Herzl. That's simply not true. Theodore Herzl is the, the father of modern Zionism. The reason he has that nickname, the father of modern Zionism, is because he was born in 1806 and he was modern. That's, uh, he was born in 1860, rather, not 1806. Oy. And uh, he was a, a father of modern political Zionism. Zionism, biblical, historical Jewish Zionism, goes back 3,000 years, definitely, and arguably 5,000 years. I'm an Orthodox Jew, and we believe it goes back 5,000 years, which started with Abraham. But we'll talk about that. I wanna talk about the Jewish history of Jerusalem because this is Jerusalem, obviously, especially now, think about what's going on right now, right this minute. Yesterday, sirens were, were going off in Jerusalem right here because Jerusalem is the most contentious city in the world. Different groups claim ownership. Different groups claim that it's holy to them. Jerusalem has an 100% Jewish history. There's always been a Jewish, Jewish presence in Jerusalem. It's always been our absolute holy site. It was not the capital of Israel all the time. For the first 400 years, actually, uh, the capital of Israel was Shiloh. It wasn't Jerusalem, but after 400 years, after Joshua crossed the river and made Shiloh the capital, uh, after those first 400 years, Jerusalem became our capital, and it has been since, and it will always be. As you can see, 
All the historical ancient biblical stuff took place in Jerusalem. The binding of Isaac, Akedat Yitzchak, took place in Jerusalem. When we talk about these things in our history, they didn't happen in random places around the world. They happened right here, right on the soil where I'm standing. You can see it, you know, at around zero, uh, you've got the advent of Christianity. And then in 610 CE, you've got the advent of Islam. And then by the time the Crusaders came and conquered Jerusalem in 1099 CE, you've already had 3,000 years of documented Jewish history in Jerusalem. And that's not, you know, including the 5,000 years if you want to go back all the way, you know, to Adam and Eve. Um, Anyway, so we've got the history. As you can see, Theodore Herzl only came onto the scene in 1860, so he's very modern. Uh, Zionism did not start with him. Our history of Jerusalem, our history of Israel did not start with him. And um, Jerusalem then went under consecutive colonial rule. Different foreign invaders came and conquered, conquered, conquered. And ultimately, in 1967, it, uh, Jerusalem was liberated and reunified. Thank God we kicked out the foreign colonizing Jordanians and liberated Jerusalem. We'll talk about that. Actually, yesterday, we just celebrated Jerusalem Day in Israel when the rockets started raining. And I was actually at the Jerusalem Day parade yesterday when we heard the sirens in Jerusalem and the music turned off and the, everyone ran for cover. And the police told us to lie down on the ground on our stomachs. It was, you know, it was, what do you even do, right? I mean, this is the reality on the ground. It's terrible, but this is the reality. So I want to jump right into the legal rights. As you can see here, this is the map of British Mandate Palestine. I hope no one's confused as to where the name Palestine actually comes from, because we're going to refer to it as Palestine when it is called Palestine. When it is called British Mandate Palestine, that's what we call it. And when it's called Israel, we call it that. And when it was called Judea, we call it that. British, Lauren, uh, the word Palestine, sorry, go ahead. Lauren, it's just a little too fast and it's so loud that it's starting to echo. If you okay, can. sure. Hold on. Let me see if I can fix that. One sec. But it's okay. Just a little slower if you can. Sure. All right. Thanks. Um, all right. You got it. So um, the word Palestine actually comes, it's a Roman word. And uh, the Romans named it Palestine. Emperor Hadrian uh, named it Palestine after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 536 CE. So why did he name it that? Because it was called Judea and he wanted to erase the Jewish connection to the land of Israel. Uh, and it was a tactical move. It was clever. Language has long been used to manipulate uh, the connection of the Jewish people to the land. It's long been used to erase the connection of the Jewish people to the land. And Emperor Hadrian knew that. That's why he changed the name of the land from Judea to Palestine. That's why that word is there for no other reason. It does not refer to the modern day Arab Palestinians uh, because it actually refers to the Plishtim, uh, which were the, en the greatest enemy of the Jews at that time. And they were a Greek sea people who were long expelled by 536 CE, by the way. They were long expelled by the time Emperor Hadrian renamed the land. Uh, so it was just a, a logistic move for him to rename it. Anyway, let's jump into it. British Mandate Palestine. So in the 20th century, the mandate system was instituted by the League of Nations. So this was a system. The League of Nations was basically a governing body of all the free countries in the world at the time, kind of after the war. They ruled over the democratic free countries, and they had a, a vested interest in doing certain things. They had an interest in not allowing expansionist motives of countries. They didn't want countries overtaking other countries. They didn't want countries committing genocide. The League of Nations valued human rights. They valued everyone's civil freedoms. They were a good organization. They ultimately turned into the United Nations, which we all know is a terrible anti-Semitic organization nowadays. But when it was the League of Nations, they actually had good intentions and they did good things for different countries around the world. Now they instituted the mandate system. The mandate system in the 20th century gave mandate powers, it gave sort of administrative powers to non-self-governing territories. Put that simply, it means it allowed certain countries to babysit other countries. That's all it did. It didn't allow other countries to own countries. The mandate for Palestine, so the mandate who got the power over that land of Israel, it was Britain. It was the British mandate of Palestine. They did not own it. In no way, at no time did they own it. They simply administered it. They simply babysat it and they stated in their mandate that they were simply babysitting it. They were overlooking that territory until the Jews were ready to self-govern. So that was understood. 
the British, people say, why were the British there anyway? They were colonizers. Of course they were. The British are one of the most famous colonizers, most successful colonizing entities in the world. They shouldn't have been there anyway. However, for people who say the British shouldn't have had the ownership, it should revert back to who had it before, which were the Ottomans. The Ottoman Empire, right? The British only got control through the League of Nations after the Ottoman Empire broke up after World War I. The Ottomans should not regain control. Why? Because they were also colonizers. The Ottomans, another hugely successful colonizing entity. They also moved through the Middle East and conquered and colonized. They were foreign invaders. They, were they should have never been in Israel either. So when people argue, you know, when we go onto university campuses and say the British had no right, it should revert to the Ottomans, I say, what gives the Ottomans the right? They took it over simply before the British. Anyway, simply put, they were babysitting the Jewish land until the Jews were ready to self-govern. That's what the British mandate for Palestine was. In no way was it owned by anyone other than the Jews. So the original mandate for Palestine allotted far more territory to the region than what is current Israel. As if you can see my necklace, I'm wearing a map of what is current Israel, actually, though it does not include the Golan Heights, unfortunately. Um, basically, the map you can see here on the screen, that was supposed to be the state of Israel, the legal state of Israel. That was British Mandate Palestine. That was intended to be the Jewish country, a Jewish entity, Jewish statehood, all right? However, in 1922 and leading up to 1922, there was a lot of Arab violence. There was a lot of Arab riots. Of course, the Arab world did not like this. This was a chunk of territory that was supposed to be given for a national Jewish homeland. And there was a lot of Arab riots as a result of this. So what did the British do? What did the international community call for? They called for appeasement. They said, in no way can this all be a Jewish state. So they said, fine. The British said, fine, uh, sort of with the blessings of the overriding uh, international bodies at the time and they divided the land. They said, we'll divide it in half, and that way we'll appease the Arabs. Half for the Arabs, an Arab state, and half for the Jewish state. You know, their ideas of half were a little wonky. Apparently, they weren't good at math because they didn't divide it 50-50. 77% of the land went for an Arab state, and it became what is now known as Jordan. Jordan did not exist as such before this time. So that made Jordan, and we got the 23% remaining, which is basically what's on my necklace now, modern-day Israel, what it looks like the map now. All right, moving on. So you can see we're up to about 1923. You can see the first panel here in 1920, the original allotment, the British mandate, what our legal nation was supposed to be. Then you can see when they divided it. And now we're going to get into around 1947, 1948, when we lose even more territory. The Jews, unfortunately, in the state of Israel have been losing and losing and losing territory for a long time. So let's move into that. Legal rights and international laws. Now, this is always interesting because when we're on university campuses, people always say the words international law, and yet they never know what it actually means. And they can't cite one international law to save their life. You know, they always say Israel is in violation of international law. So I always say, okay, give me one international law that they're violating. Uh, well, I, uh, I, I don't know. They can never cite one international law. Here you've got five legally binding, internationally recognized laws that are all still valid today that give the Jewish people legal rights and ownership over the land of Israel, the five in blue. So 1917, Balfour Declaration, 1920, San Remo Resolution, very important. 1922, Mandate for Palestine, that was the map that I just showed you, the Mandate for Palestine, the territory that was allotted to us at that time. And then you've got 1924, the Anglo-American Convention, which is rarely talked about, but just as important. And then you've got the establishment of the United Nations itself when the League of Nations turned into the United Nations in 1945. We'll talk about their charter, their charter, which is still valid today. Then you've got the 1947 UN partition plan, which people often cite, but it's completely erroneous. You need not pay attention to the 1947 plan because it's rendered moot. And I'll explain why in a minute. But let me elaborate on these international laws first. This gives the Jewish people and the, the state of Israel governance over the land of Israel, legally. So um, this is a flyer, by the way, that I designed uh, for Heru Canada. If you would like it, if you would like me to send you this specific flyer, uh, please write to me after the talk and I'll, set, I'll email it to you. The Balfour Declaration, this is as, as simply as I can put it. The British foreign minister declares that the British government views with favor a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, that can be contended. People say, what does in Palestine mean? It's not defined borders. It's not this. It's not that. 
we can get into that and we can talk about it. But just know that the Balfour Declaration, uh, Declaration was the first foundational document that gives us legal rights to this, the land of Israel as the state of Israel. Now, in 1917, the Balfour Declaration was not international law. It was not. In 1917, it was merely a suggestion. It was merely a letter being written by the, the British saying, we view with favor of Jewish homeland there. However, in 1920, it became international law. It became binding international law in 1920 when it was ratified by the Allied Supreme Council of World War I at the San Remo Resolution. That's, I know it's complicated. There's a lot of organizations at play here, but just know that that's the moment it became international law. Then the mandate for Palestine in 1922 actually reified that law. It was reified to say, we still affirm that the Balfour Declaration is uh, binding international law plus the mandate for Palestine, which defined the borders. As I showed you the map, that big chunk of modern day Israel plus Jordan, what we would get, that was in 1922. All the land under international law was designated as a Jewish homeland. The Anglo-American Convention in 1924, uh, they confirmed the text of the mandate for Palestine. They approved it, they signed it, and they said, now this is international law. The mandate for Palestine text to say where the Jews own, where they are allowed to settle, is now binding international law. Uh, and it said, there's a quote, it says, in the Anglo-American Convention, there are the rights of the Jewish people to settle in all parts of the land of Israel. That means including in Gaza, in Judea and Samaria, which is now known as the West Bank, in all parts of the land of Israel. Then we've got the United Nations Charter itself, Article 80. Please, I, I recommend you go online and read it. It's readily available online. You can go onto the UN website and read it. Article 80, uh, so the United Nations Charter was established, right? Uh, it turned from the League of Nations into the United Nations. Unfortunately for us, because the United Nations has since become just a terrible organization filled with anti-Israel, anti-democratic countries. Uh, I mean, the United Nations just elected, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia onto its Women's Rights Council. It's, it's absurd. Uh, an organization that would do that really shows you uh, kind of the credibility. We shouldn't really be taking our, our moral cues from an organization that would elect such a human rights violating country onto their human rights uh, tribunal. Anyway. Article 80 of the UN Charter, when they established their charter, Article 80 says that all previous mandates, all previous mandates from the League of Nations are still binding. We still uphold them, we still recognize them, and they are now transferred to the United Nations. Meaning, Balfour Declaration, San Remo Resolution, Mandate for Palestine, and Anglo-American Convention are all recognized by the UN Charter, and they are still binding international law until today, 2021, they are still international law, which means under all these international laws, the Jews have the right to settle anywhere in the land of Israel as it is the Jewish national state. Why did I talk about um, the UN partition plan of 1947 being moot, being null and void? It just doesn't count. Why? Because it was in contravention of international law. The UN in 1947 had no right to pass this resolution. They had no right to even suggest this resolution in 1947. Why? Which international laws were they contravening? All the ones I just mentioned. The aforementioned international laws, all five of them, were being contravened by this partition plan. So they broke their own charter. Article 80 states that they could not do this, and yet they put this resolution forward anyway. It was illegal. However, it's moot. Why? Because the Arabs rejected it anyways. They did not accept it. So the red land on the map was suggested as an Arab state. The blue land was suggested as a Jewish state. Keep in mind, the Jewish national homeland has already been parsed apart and divided away. Remember that chunk from national mandate Palestine? We were supposed to have this. Then it got cut because 77% got taken away for appeasement purposes. And now this resolution, which is telling us to give more land away. We can't have another land. The half that we got has to be subdivided again. This is approximately, it's offering the Jews 56% of the land in the, um, inter in the UN partition plan here of 1947. Doesn't matter. The Arabs rejected it and instead they launched a war. Therefore, this partition plan counts for nothing. All right, let's move forward. So here's what we get, especially in the media and on college campuses, the enemies of Israel, the people saying that Israel is violating international law, that don't want Israel to exist, they will cite for you 
the Geneva Convention Article 4. This is their big one. This is the big, you know, intellectual moment they're having where they say, ha ha, we can point to something in international law that says Israel is violating the law. So in the fourth Geneva Convention, Article 4, it states, and you can read it here, uh, persons protected by the conventions, or blah, 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 and it talks about occupation, the occupying power. So that's the operative word here, occupying power. So they say that Israel is occupying Palestinian territory, or other ones say Israel is occupying Arab territory. Uh, you often get that on university campuses as well. And that's why they're in violation of international law. Well, that is simply not true, and I'll explain why. We have a lot of reasons why Article 4 of the Geneva Convention has nothing to do with Israel, and it doesn't prove anything because Israel is not in violation of Article 4 of the Geneva Convention. I'll give you the top three reasons uh, because we don't have, you know, an, uh, 10 hours to go through it, but the top three reasons. Number one, the Geneva Convention came about after, after the Nazis uh, basically took over all of Europe and tried to take over the whole world. We know what the Nazis did during the war and they had expansionist motives. And they, you know, had it not been for the allies and everything, they would have succeeded. They took over a huge chunk of Europe. So the League of Nations came together and said, you know, um, uh, the, not the League of Nations, my apologies. Uh, the Geneva Convention came together and said, we need to stop countries from ever doing this again. And rightfully so. Countries can't just be allowed to take over their neighbors whenever they feel like it with military might. We don't want another situation where Germany takes over, you know, just Poland because it feels like it has a right to do that. So they wanted to stop countries with expansionist motives. However, as we saw from the legal right, how Israel has been losing and losing and losing and losing territory, Israel is not an expansionist country. It is the opposite of an expansionist country. In fact, people have been stealing Israeli territory for generations. Israel has not only not gotten bigger, it's never gotten bigger. Um, at times when we got things in defensive wars, for example, when we got the Sinai, we gave that back. Uh, we give back a hell of a lot of territory that we get legally. We're not expansionist. If we were expansionist, we would be trying to take over other countries. We would keep territory that we gain in defensive wars. And honestly, the IDF, just thinking logically, is probably the strongest army in the world. If they wanted to expand, they could very easily do so. We do. As Israel, we choose not to be an expansionist country. We don't want anyone else's territory. We simply want our own territory. And so this does not apply because this article is intended to stop expansionist countries. Number two, Israel liberated Judea and Samaria, which is what the media calls the West Bank nowadays, in a defensive war in 1967. Geneva Convention Article 4 is talking about an offensive war, a war, where you, a war of aggression, a war where you attack. Israel was in a defensive war in 1967, and people will say, oh, Israel attacked first. Israel fired the first shot. So what? That does not mean they were not in a defensive war. It uh, doesn't matter who fires the first shot. Israel was in a defensive war, and they liberated Judea and Samaria, which had been held from 1948 to 1967 by Jordan, the colonizing, occupying Jordanians who divided Jerusalem, ethnically cleansed it of Jews, des destroyed shuls and synagogues, did not allow any Jews uh, into parts of Jerusalem. Thank God in 1967, Israel liberated Jerusalem. They kicked the Jordanians out. So because it was a defensive war, this article does not apply. And the last reason I'll give you is the most poignant reason, the simplest one, Article 4 refers to the invasion of sovereign recognized states. I think you see where I'm going with this because Palestine, Arab, Pal modern day Arab Palestine was never a sovereign country or territory of any sort. It does not apply. It's talking about the invasion of a territory into another sovereign territory. That's the definition of occupation, actually. A sovereign territory taking over the territory of another sovereign entity, another sovereign state. Since Arab Palestine was never a sovereign state or country or entity, it, it just doesn't apply. There's no occupation, therefore, Article 4 of the Geneva Convention does not apply. So if you find yourself in a debate with someone on the intellectual side who says, I have an international law that Israel is violating its Geneva Convention, you can now say, actually, it does not apply to Israel. It does not apply to the situation here at all. Now, despite legal ownership, Israel has offered land for peace numerous times countless times. Actually, every day of Israel's existence is basically one giant offer of land for peace. And whether you agree with that or not, it, it's the reality on the ground. But we can point to, you know, six major offers of land for peace in our, in our modern Israeli history. 
and all of them have been rejected by the Arabs. And I use the term Arabs because most of them were rejected by the Arabs before the advent of Palestinian nationalism uh, with Yasser Arafat in the mid 1960s. So you've got the Peel Commission in 1937, uh, the UN vote, as we talked about in 1947. Again, that's moot, but the Arabs rejected it nonetheless. The Jews technically accepted it, even though it was in contravention of international law. You've got 1967, another major Arab rejection with the summit in Khartoum in Sudan, uh, with the famous three no's, no peace, no uh, recognition, no negotiation with Israel, right? That was, a, uh, and then in 2000, uh, Ehud Barak, our prime minister, offered Yasser Arafat a major offer of land for peace. Basically 100% of Gaza, 94% of the West Bank, plus East Jerusalem, and the Arabs rejected it. And then in 2008, you basically have the same offer, which I personally think was a terrible offer, uh, but it was offered anyway. And uh, it was also rejected by Mahmoud Abbas. And then modern day, you've got Trump's deal of the century, which kind of never actually happened, which would have made a, a de facto Palestinian state. However, it was outright rejected. Actually, Mahmoud Abbas rejected it before they even read it. So uh, Trump put out the peace deal of the century and Mahmoud Abbas said that they would reject it before they even read the text of the deal. So even despite all these international laws we're talking about, Israel acting in good faith because they care about the people in the region and humanity and democracy, they have offered land for peace on numerous occasions and have been met with nothing but hostility, violence and Arab rejectionism. Uh, unfortunately, this comes mostly from the leaders of the Arab world. You know, we're not blaming the, the modern day Palestinians or the Arabs who are being oppressed themselves by the governments. For example, the people in Gaza are extremely oppressed by Hamas. Uh, you've got um, uh, the people in uh, Judea and Samaria known as the West Bank who are also not treated well by the Palestinian Authority government. Um, but this is the reality. We have to know that Israel owns every inch of modern day Israel plus, and yet, they still offer in good faith land for peace. They are willing to give up land that is legally under international law owned as the Jewish state. Now, uh, I just want to touch on, uh, yes, I've got time. I want to touch on the three major UN resolutions that people always cite against Israel. You've got 181, 194, and 242. Those are the probably the most famous resolutions with re regard to Israel. Now we see this a lot on university campuses. Again, people don't actually know the nuance of the UN resolutions, but let me explain it to you. Now, there are two different types of UN resolutions, General Assembly resolutions and Security Council resolutions. Now, General Assembly resolutions, which are the vast majority of UN resolutions, they are non-binding. They are simply suggestions, and to be honest, they are not worth the paper they're printed on. They are just, they're nothing, they're suggestions. It's the UN body coming together and saying, we suggest that Israel stop violating international law. It really means nothing. However, UN Security Council resolutions are binding under international law, specifically under Chapter 7 and Chapter 8 of the UN mandate. They are binding. It's confusing. It doesn't matter. UN Resolution 181, let's look at that. That's the Partition Plan Resolution. That's 1947, the one we talked about that's in contravention of international law that never should have been allowed. Anyway, that was a General Assembly resolution. So it was just a suggestion. Even if it had been accepted by the Arabs and the Jews, there was absolutely uh, no insistence. Israel had no requirement to accept it because it was General Assembly, meaning it was just a suggestion. Israel should partition the land. Okay, now moving on to Resolution 194, which is a famous one that the BDS movement quotes a lot. The BDS movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel, which is the anti-Israel movement on university campuses nowadays, they cite UN Resolution 194 all the time. Why? Because it's in their three uh, tenets. The BDS movement has three tenets that their movement is built on. One is have, give Palestinian citizens equal rights in the land. The second is remove the apartheid wall, also known as the security fence in Israel. And the third is allow all Palestinian refugees to come back to Israel under UN Resolution 194. So they're always citing UN Resolution 194. What is it? Well, here's the text so you can actually read it because a lot of people have never seen the text of the resolution. Any refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be allowed to do so at their earliest convenience, okay? It seems pretty legitimate. It's a good resolution. I mean, any you know conscious person who cares about human rights would say, yeah, I agree with that resolution, go ahead. The problem is we've got some problems with this resolution. Number one is that 
again, it's general assembly, so it's non-binding. There is no onus on Israel to accept this. Now, the major problem with this resolution is that the definition of a refugee differs between the entire world and the Palestinians. So there is one refugee agency that governs every single refugee in the world. And I mean every single refugee. The UNHCR, the UN Worldwide Refugee Agency, governs every refugee. However, there's one other organization, and that organization is called UNRWA, and they only govern Palestinian refugees. So I know this might be mind boggling because it's so ridiculous. You've got two refugee agencies in the entire world. One governs all the refugees of the world, and one just governs Palestinian refugees. So we see now that here's a problem. According to UNRWA, there are 5 million Palestinian refugees in the world today. And according to certain other organizations, there are between 5 and 20 million Palestinian refugees today. So under UNRWA's definition of a refugee, they want all these 5 million refugees to return to Israel. Now, what's the problem with the definition itself? Well, under the UN agency's um, worldwide definition of a refugee, it's a person who flees a country. A person who flees a country because of danger or persecution or whatever. UNRWA's definition of a Palestinian refugee differs. They define a refugee as a person who flees a country because of danger and all the descendants on the father's side. Meaning, UNRWA has created a Palestinian refugee problem in perpetuity, forever. There will never stop being Palestinian refugees because the great, 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 great grandson of a Palestinian refugee who lives in Italy, who was born in New Jersey, who's never set foot in the Middle East, is considered a Palestinian refugee under UNRWA's definition. This is why we have a problem of five to 20 to who knows how many, impossible to define Palestinian refugees nowadays. So UN Resolution 194 calls for all of them to be allowed back into Israel, literally obliterating Israel as a Jewish state as we know it. Also, the other problem, when no one ever talks about with UN, uh, uh, UN Resolution 194, is that what about the Jewish refugees? No one ever talks about that. I mean, there were almost a million Jewish refugees created in the 1948 war, far more Jewish refugees from Arab countries who were expelled than there were Arab refugees created from Israel in the 1948 war, and yet no one talks about it. So these are issues uh, we cannot let just go by without saying something. We have to address these issues when people bring up Resolution 194. The one uh, that I was asked to touch on specifically is UN Resolution 242, uh, and it is important. UN Resolution 242, this is a Security Council resolution. So it's different than the, the prior two I just mentioned. This is technically binding under international law. This was passed in 1967, and it is regarding the withdrawal and supposed peace of the region. I say supposed because we'll get into kind of the, the ludicrousy of, of this resolution. Now, after Israel liberated the land from the occupying Jordanians, remember, in 1948, Israel declared independence and six Arab countries attacked Israel at the same time. Illegally, of course. Those were a war of aggression and it was illegal. And Jordan illegally occupied Judea and Samaria and then changed the name to the West Bank for 19 years. So when Israel liberated Judea and Samaria from Jordan in 1967, suddenly the UN had something to say about it and they decided to pass UN Resolution 242. They wanted Israel, Israel to withdraw from what they call the territories now, which is Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland of Israel that had been occupied. So the clause includes the text. It says withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from the territories occupied in the recent conflict. So therein lies our first problem. Israel did not occupy anything in 1967. They did the opposite. They liberated the territory from illegal occupiers who were occupying the land in contravention of all those international laws we mentioned before. Also, you can't occupy something that you already own. Again, if you have the title deed to your house and you go live in there, someone can't blame you for occupying it. You own it. You own it. Um, no one else owns it. You can't occupy it. Also, there's a clause in UN Resolution 242 that states that all countries in the area should have a right to live in peace within secure and recognized boundaries. Aha, therein lies the second problem here, because Israel has always agreed to peace, especially when they've been giving land for peace deals. However, the enemies of Israel and the other countries invading and attacking Israel do not agree to peace. At that time in 1967, we saw that the Khartoum summit, they had the three no's, no peace, no recognition, and no negotiation of Israel. They did not, they unequivocally said no to peace, which means that this resolution could not pass because it says all the countries, all the states in the region have to agree to live in peace with one another 
but Israel did not have any partners for peace at that time. So that's uh, another issue we have. Also, the last thing to note, just interestingly enough, when people say it's about the Palestinians, this resolution does not mention the Palestinians. Not once is the word Palestinian in this resolution um, because the idea of Palestinian nationalism that was kind of invented with Yasser Arafat in the mid 1960s hadn't really taken off at this time. Uh, it was more pan-Arab nationalism. It wasn't Palestinian nationalism. And therefore the words Palestinian aren't mentioned in the resolution at all, which is just, interesting food for thought. Um, but that's that's kind of what I wanted to touch on. Now I've I've talked for 40 minutes here and I, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, hopefully you guys have some questions or or any comments. I'm here to answer anything I can. Uh, well, uh, Lauren, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I would like just to, uh, I don't know, either to make a statement or to ask a question. Um, Okay, as far as I know, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, I will be happy to see the quotas. Uh, as far as I know, the land of Israel, uh, whatever boundaries we're talking about, was never promised to the uh, Jews as, um, as, the, as a state. I mean, never ever uh, before the partition plan. Actually, what was, uh, as you uh, mentioned, um, the Brits were babysitting the land for the local peoples. That, that's true indeed. And again, as far as I know, we are talking about um, the peoples, meaning uh, Arabs and Jews alike. They never talk about um, Jews specifically. So if I am wrong, I will be happy to learn and I will be happy to see uh, you know, the, the written version of it. Sure. So um, in, in the previous international laws, uh, starting at the Balfour Declaration, even before in some of the papers that were passed up and down uh, between the British government and uh, the Israeli leaders at the time, uh, well, I call them Israeli, but you know, the, the leaders who were in Palestine at the time, um, they did refer to it as a Jewish national homeland. Uh, so that's what it is. The text in the Balfour Declaration is a Jewish national homeland. Right. Um, and they, they do talk about an Arab state as well. Of course, it was never intended to be just some sort of annexed, large, unanimous body of just Jews. Of course not. Okay. Actually, I mean, other, well, okay. In other words, Balfour Declaration, again, is not a legal document. It's an idea, sort of an intention. And uh, we, we cannot talk about uh, boundaries. We cannot talk about uh, future borders of the future state, Jewish state of Israel, because this was never mentioned. So, okay, we are on the so, same right. page. So the boundaries were never mentioned in the Balfour Declaration, that's true. The boundaries only came into place with the mandate for Palestine in 1922. And but again, which was for both Arabs and Jews. Well, right now I have, uh, I can hear the loudspeaker outside telling us that we have to prepare our bomb shelters. So things are progressing mm -hmm. here. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, but the, the Balfour Declaration, as you say, in 1917, it was not international law, but it did become part of international law in 1920. All of the text became part of international law. So when people say it's just a suggestion, not that's not true anymore. It was a suggestion when it was written in 1917, but in 1920 and then again in 1922, it was reified as binding international law. So today, if you need a document to cite of international law upon which Israel is founded, you can cite the Balfour Declaration as a do as a, a foundational document now. So it's kind of oh, it was yeah. it was retroactive the way it happened for the Balfour Declaration. Yes. Okay, but anyhow, we are talking about British mandate Palestine meant to be the homeland of Jews and Arabs with no borders defined. Okay, agree right, about exactly. that, right? Okay, fine. Yes. Uh, yeah, and yet another thing, just a little something. Um, the term uh, Palestine is much older than the Romans. Uh, the term Palestine, okay, not regarding Jews, Arabs, etc., but the terminology of Palestine for the land, okay, exists starting from the fifth century uh, BCE. That, that's way earlier. Uh, so that's just an historical fact. Okay, I can show it to you later. Okay, but it doesn't matter to, to the discussion. Okay, sorry for jumping in and uh, that's it. That's all I had to say. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll mute myself. There's a tremendous number of talking points you've put forward here. And I really appreciate you getting to some of that detail because most of us are completely blindsided and rather stupid when it comes to that parts of history, you have to admit that. Uh, the, um, I'm just wondering if, if you can reflect on 
today, I mean, like this minute and the current episode that we're into, which is probably episode number 10 or 15 of Arab aggression, the Israeli counter shot, counter strikes and so forth. Uh, are they basing any of this on a backward look towards the talking points you've mentioned? Interesting question. So one of the things that the violence right now, currently the rocket alarms are coming in on my phone. Right now, the violence in part is being blamed on the Sheikh Jarrah evictions. Uh, if you've heard about that in the news and I can see someone mentioned it in the chat uh, and they are citing international law for that. They're saying Israel is violating international law by evicting these four Palestinian families from the village of Sheikh Jarrah. So it's interesting you say that. Right now, the tension's going on. They're finding a pretext of international law to suggest that Israel's violating stuff. Um, to be clear, I don't know what you guys uh, know about the Sheikh Jarrah uh, situation, but the village there is thousands of years old. And it, for a long time, it was called the Shimon HaTzadik village. It wasn't called Sheikh Jarrah until the Jordanians named it that during that time we talked about where the Jordanians illegally occupied the land. Um, after the 1948 war, where Jordan took the land illegally, they moved families in there naturally because now they were holding land, they were occupying it, so they wanted Arabs to come settle there. And they brought them in and they renamed Shimon HaTzadik village, which had been named that for 3,000 years. Um, they named it Sh uh, Sheikh Jarrah. So these Palestinian families, Arabs and now Palestinian families, were living there actually rent-free for the last couple of decades. They haven't been paying any rent because they didn't have a, a deed. They didn't own a title deed to the house, to the land, to nothing. They didn't have ownership. They were just moved in there by the Jordanians and they've been living there rent-free. So this whole thing started, which has been in Israeli court for a long time. We're only hearing about it now on the news uh, because you know, with these protests and the violence and it's come, kind of come to a head because it's in the Israeli Supreme Court now but it's been in the Israeli courts for a long time. And uh, basically the problem is that it started with the Jewish land owners who have the title deed to the land saying, actually we own this land and we want the people living there to pay rent. And the Palestinian families didn't want to. They said, we've been living for decades without paying rent. We're not gonna pay some Jewish landowner rent who's come back now. So it got taken through the courts, whatever. And now the Supreme Court is threatening to evict them because they refuse to pay rent. And also the Jewish people have come back and say, we have the deed to the land. So that's what's going on. Now the violence in Jerusalem and in Israel is in part being blamed on that. They're saying because of these impending evictions, the violence has erupted. Obviously we know that's not true. That's what we call a pretext. They're making an excuse for violence that already existed. I mean, the violence, this round of violence has been going on for months now, all through the month of, of Ramadan, which has just passed and before. And the eviction stuff has been going on for, I think, years, actually, that it's been in the Israeli courts before it got to the Supreme Court. So it's a pretext. It's not actually what's causing it. But yes, people are saying Israel's violating international law, therefore violence, right? That's just one thing uh, that we see on university campuses all the time. The major thing that I hear when I go and speak on university campuses is that people say Israel stole Palestinian land. They occupied it. The Balfour Declaration, all this stuff is illegal. <clears throat> it doesn't count. It was, you know, colonialist, all these things. Colonialist is a big word they use to describe Israel, interestingly enough, because Israel is actually the most successful um, example of decolonizing a place in human history. Israel is the most successful example of kicking out colonialists and bringing back indigenous people. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that the major claim against Israel, especially on university campuses, is colonialism. Uh, what I say, if you're wondering when people uh, attack Israel with regard to colonialism, you can always say, this is the first thing I say, I say, what's the empire? Who's the colony? What's the power? Where are the other colonies? Whose flag did Israel plant when they got the land? What are you talking about? Because people then back themselves into a corner. They realize, is Israel the empire or is it the colony? If it's the empire, where are the other colonies? Where have we tried to take over other land? What are we, what are we absorbing into this colonial empire? Where did we come from if this is colonizing? If Israel's a colony, who are we a colony of? Britain? I mean, we hated Britain. We really, Britain contravened our international law and really prevented Jewish immigration. They did pretty bad stuff to the Jews in, in the land of Israel around and before the 1940s. So who's the empire? Who's the colony? Ultimately, usually on university campuses, we get to a point where people say, uh, the Jews, the Jews are colonizing. Ah, now we're getting into dangerous, slippery, anti-Semitic territory. There's like this conspiracy of a Jewish empire in the world that's somehow just taking over countries. 
obviously we're not and that's you know rhetoric that's like nazi rhetoric really that comes from the protocols of the elders of zion that's just classic anti-jewish rhetoric what are they talking about colonialism often again these people don't even know how to define the word colonialism but it's very simple to disprove the colonialist argument uh anyway I, that was a bit of my tangent but i, I hope i answered your question <laughs> Great, should we see, I know, um, Lauren, a lot of people have been asking if they can, like, could have taken screenshots of what, of your presentation, is that okay? Oh, sure, you want me to, yeah, yeah. Let okay, no, they, they got, I think they were getting it as you were going, I just wanted to make oh. sure that you're okay with it, and then a lot of people have also been enjoying it and asking where they could see it later, so I let them know that it will be up on our, on our YouTube. Awesome. Um, do you want may, to- I, May I suggest a line of logic? Can wait, Alvin? Yeah. I, sorry, I, I just was was trying to say that we should go through questions that people have already asked in in the uh, chat. Is that okay? That's go fine. Ahead. I just want to say something at some point, but go ahead. I'm 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 good. Okay, thanks. I saw I saw a question that someone asked when when was the Geneva Convention? It was in 1929. Uh, well, the first the first, the first one. one again. It's been updated and updated and updated. The fourth Geneva Convention, the one that I was referring to, uh, came after the Nazis, after World War II. But the first Geneva Convention was in 1929. Okay. Um, Julia, did you want to read the questions or should, do you, do you want me to read questions? Julia usually reads them. Yeah, sure. I can read the uh, I can read the questions. Uh, I just had to say that I don't want again. I don't want to, to interfere because this is uh, Lauren's presentation. But I just have to say that there is a total different way of understanding of the events in Sheikh Jarrah, and there's actually a uh, totally different uh, historical information which at least I possess regarding uh, the subject of uh, Shimon Tzadik neighborhood, which used to be there. So, but I don't know. It, it's it's. Uh, it's my thing, uh, but I totally disagree with Warren. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, Julia, I'm surprised there's only two sides to the story. I would expect six. Oh no, well, of course there are more than two sides. Of course there are more than two sides, but uh, well, at least there are minimum of two different ways to understand the situation there. Um, yeah. Okay. I, 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 um, I, I so, can ask questions if that's better. Yeah, okay, maybe you do so. Uh, Ilana, yeah, go for it. Okay, I don't know. Um, so I don't know if you answer this. We were pro uh, we were promised land by the British. Was it that whole area? You may have answered that. So yeah, British Mandate Palestine was the whole area of modern Israel plus Jordan. Right, okay. Right. Um, Alvin's asking if you can discuss 1949 armistice agreement between Jordan and Israel. Sure. So a lot of people talk about the 1967 borders, which is a misnomer. It's, it's a mistake because there are no 1967 borders, actually. But there is a 1949 armistice line, which runs roughly along the same borders that you see now, kind of where it uh, delineates the West Bank, Judea and Samaria from actual Israel. So the 1949 armistice line, uh, it wasn't a border of any kind. An armistice line is simply a line where the fighting stops. It was not a legal border uh, under any conceivable international law. There was fighting and then there was ceasefires and it was basically the ceasefire line. It's also known as the green line because on the map it was drawn in green pen when the leaders agreed to uh, stop fighting. So it's simply a line of ceasefire. It was never intended to create a border. Unfortunately, the international community uses kind of that line of delineation to create a de facto Palestinian state within Israel, although it was never intended to, it was simply a, an armistice line, a ceasefire line. Uh, I hope that explains it well. Let, let me add to this, this is what I wanted to discuss, because it's actually a very a very legal argument here. And, and I'll take a minute or so. Okay, so the British in 1940, the, the, uh, the Arab Legion invaded with a British, a British, British officer by uh, Glob Pasha. Okay, so they went in, and they took the land up to 1967. And there was an agreement and the borders were without prejudice as it's termed, and they had no meaning. So that was going on for 19 years. And then, so you had agreement, a bilateral agreement between Jordan and Israel, which trumps international agreement, is it trumps UN agreements. But in 1967, before the Jordanians attacked, the Eshkol government said to King Hussein, we're not going to start a war with you. Do not start anything. So what did the Jordanians do? They broke their own agreement. 
So whatever they had is, is, is meaningless so that Israel is, has every right, as they always had, to all the West Bank. And people really don't discuss the legal issue of the Armistice Agreement, which was violated. The Jordanians actually violated it twice. And if you see in 242, use resolution 242, the word the is missing, which reduces everything to a territorial dispute, one of 200 in this world. And you can have, have emotional arguments, but it's all about the, the legal arguments. And the problem is that people don't understand history and quite frankly don't, don't care about history. And, and this is the overriding problem. But I think that this armistice agreement is the anchor point, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Judy's, Thank you a Judy's asking about uh, preemptive strikes. What about preemptive, preemptive strikes? So under international, you mean, I assume you mean under international law. Um, there are different international laws that talk about preemptive strikes with regard to wars. So basically, under generally accepted international law, wars of aggression, acquiring territory in a war of aggression, meaning an offensive war where you attack a country, is illegal. So we use the Germany example. Germany can't just invade Poland and keep Poland as territory. That's illegal under international law. Uh, acquiring territory in a defensive war is actually legal. So if Germany invaded Poland and Poland pushed them back and went into German territory, Poland can actually legally keep whatever they acquire in Germany because they were defending themselves. So too, with Israel's history, pretty much every conceivable major war we've been in has been a defensive war. So any territory we acquired, when we acquired uh, Judea and Samaria, when we acquired the Golan Heights, when we acquired the Sinai Peninsula, it's all legal for us to keep. Of course, we've given a lot of it back in attempts of land for peace and in good faith. And also we don't need a lot of it. You know, Israel had no desire to keep the entire Sinai. Uh, and it was strategic to give it back for different reasons. And we got peace agreements out of it. But keeping territory in a defensive war is perfectly legal. Now, preemptive strikes, it, it varies depending on what war you're in because each circumstance, each set of war situations, you have to see, was the army justified in striking first? Again, striking first does not automatically mean you are in an offensive war, you're attacking. You could still be in a defensive war. The case in point, the 1967 is a perfect example of when we did strike first, but there were warnings. We were in immediate danger. There were threats on three, on all of our borders, basically. We struck first after several warnings for armies to stand down. It's still considered a defensive war for Israel. So I, ho I hope that answers the question. Great. Um, what do you, Juliana wants to know, what do you say to people who argue Zionism was started by Christians and then adopted by Jews? So, uh, again, there are different ways to go about this. If you want to cite the religious biblical argument and go back 5,000 years, I'm an Orthodox Jew and my Zionism started with Abraham. Uh, who, there was a covenant between God and a person, which is Abraham, and a covenant between God for a land, which was the land of Israel. So Zionism arguably, start, Jewish Zionism starts back then. Uh, again, the Christian, as, we, as I showed you on the history of Jerusalem, uh, Christians came in around zero obviously the year zero, and there had already been about two and a half thousand years of Jewish history in the land of Israel and specifically in Jerusalem by that time. So uh, I can't, I wouldn't say it makes a whole lot of logical sense to say it was started by Christians because there was already a huge Zionist movement going on. And when we say Zionist movement, I'm not talking about the modern political Herzl Zionism or socialist Zionism, whatever. I'm talking about Jewish Zionism, which is inalienable. It's intricately connected to our identity, meaning we uh, as Jews have 613 mitzvot, 613 commandments. Over half of them can only be performed in the land of Israel. This has been the same for 3,000 years. It, it will always be the same. That has nothing to do with Herzl. It has nothing to do with Christians. It has nothing to do with modern political Zionism. It has to do with our Jewish faith. Uh, we pray three times a day in the direction of Jerusalem. Again, we've been doing this for over 3,000 years now. Um, it's pretty pretty logical that it would start with the Jewish religion back when the inception of Judaism. Great. Um, Harry says, with recognition by UAE, Morocco, and possibly others such as Saudi Arabia, will that pressure Palestinian leadership to agree to, to some sort of settlement? 
My personal opinion, unfortunately, I don't think so. As we can see by the fact that we've had amazing Middle East relations for the last couple months with the Abraham Accords and all the countries, you know, uh, signing on for peace and normalization of relations and, and what Trump managed to help do in the Middle East. However, um, now we've got a barrage of rockets literally as we speak falling down on us. I don't think the Abraham Accords was any, you know, deterrent to Palestinian um, nationalism, which comes along, I believe, with, with the Palestinian violence. The gov I'm not talking about the Palestinian people. I'm talking about the Palestinian governments, Hamas, who governs Gaza, and the Palestinian Authority, who governs in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. Um, they don't, they have no interest in peace with Israel. And I honestly think even if every surrounding country officially made peace with Israel, even our most hostile enemies like Iran, I, I think uh, they would say no. They're still uh, fighting for, for a cause that they really strongly believe in. Um, so no, unfortunately. But the Abraham Accords is a wonderful thing. And thank God we have normalized relations with a lot of Arab countries in the region. It's, it's wonderful. Great. Um, somebody said, currently the evictions of Palestinian families um, from Sheikh Jarrah section of Jerusalem is making headlines. Weren't Jews forcibly ex evicted and expelled from East Jerusalem, especially the old city by Arabs in 1948? So excellent question and, and very good point. Whoever stated it like that, that's well said. Uh, yes, the issue, uh, the way I understand it simply is that this whole thing is a problem because two people are vying to come back to a land because the Jews had been ethnically cleansed from that land um, until 1967. From 1948 to 1967, for 19 years, the Jordanians ethnically cleansed. Make no mistake, there was not one Jew allowed in that part of Jerusalem, in that land governed by the Jordanians at the time, occupied by the Jordanians at the time. So the Jews were ethnically cleansed. Had the Jews been there, had the Jews maintained a presence there, this Sheikh Jarrah thing never would have been an issue because Arabs and Jews would have been living next to each other since 1948. And there wouldn't be, I mean, maybe there might be eviction issues if someone refused to pay rent, whatever, but there would never have been an ethnic cleansing and then population, a demographic issue like there is now. Unfortunately, yes, the Jews were ethnically cleansed and now they've come back. Whether you agree that it's right that they came back now, maybe they did it in the wrong way, I don't know. But anyway, they've come back from that ethnic cleansing and now we've got a, a problem. Um, Richard has an interesting comment. The letter P does not exist in the Arabic language. Tell me if this is right. The Roman name Palestine was derived from a reference to Phoenician or Greek people, not the Semitic people. That's true. So there is no P in Arabic. Uh, if you've ever heard them speak, they say Philistine. No, they no. don't say Palestine. Uh, they Palestine. use F. Yeah, uh, they use F and sometimes B. If they're speaking in English and referring to it, sometimes they use the letter B instead of a P. So it's just interesting because it, it's another, it's just another point that kind of builds on showing that there never was a an Arab Palestinian sovereign place there. They didn't name it that. It wasn't Arab and it wasn't Palestinian. It was a Roman name um, derived from previous people. It had nothing to do with Arabs or Palestinians at the time. So yes, the, the P is phonetically very interesting. There is no P in Arabic. Okay. Um, Jeffrey wants to, along with a lot of people who are thanking you for your passionate and energetic presentation. Um, he's saying, does the Israeli government have any strategy to educate its citizens concerning the legal rights of Israel that you have shared? That's a great question. So organizations, I believe, like yours and ours um, are doing that. Uh, I don't know that the Israeli government itself has any programs in place like that, although they, they do educate in schools. They do teach this stuff in the school system, although not in this sort of detail and not uh, with this sort of... Um, uh, let's say, slant or, or direction. Uh, again, a lot of people, when, interestingly enough, when we educate people on university campuses, a lot of Israelis don't know this history. A lot of Israelis struggle with providing proofs for this stuff. Again, clearly North Americans also have, have barely, <laughs> very little knowledge in this, but Israelis too, surprisingly, don't know like a lot about the legal rights of Israel or some of the parts of history. It's very unfortunate. I don't know. I can't speak for the Israeli government. I'm a new immigrant. I actually don't know what the Israeli government is doing, but uh, I hope that they have programs like this in place because everyone should know the history of their own countries. Coming right. from Canada, we also, we don't learn that much about Canadian history itself, um, which is disappointing, but I, I, I hope that the Israeli government is, is doing something. It almost seems like this is as important as, you know, getting your army ready, is having knowledge prepared for... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to pose a, I was going to pose a contemporary question of how the 
political parties are lining up with the rockets falling on their heads. Um, it, it, that's a tough call. Of, <laughs> Should we talk about that after? Should we keep but, on this? Yeah, that, that, may, that may be uh, for another time. Uh, let me just keep going with these. Um, Sean is asking, wasn't there a peace treaty, peace in quotes, treaty of some kind with Jordan, where Jordan declared it had no desire, desire over the West Bank, in quotes, anymore? So even the Israel hitters who want to act like Israel's occupying the occupy West Bank, the nearest thing to a prior government is Jordan, who says they relinquish any claim to the area. Ah, okay, very good question. So actually this question, you're, you're kind of conflating two things. We've got two issues here. Yes, there's a peace treaty with Jordan. Uh, in 1994, there was a peace treaty with Jordan, which is actually very good. It has held strong and we have honestly had very little problems from Jordan, thank God. Um, but, uh, make no mistake, they have declared that they are part of, you know, pan-Arab nationalism. So should there be like a giant war in the region, God forbid, let's say World War III coming to the region, I don't think they would side with Israel. I do not think they're going to fight for and with Israel. But yes, we've got a peace treaty with Jordan and it's been fine since 1994, pretty much. Now, the other thing uh, you were saying is that didn't they re relinquish their claim on the West Bank? So that is actually in the Palestinian National Charter. So when the PLO was founded in 1964, um, they have a charter that they were founded on, right? Now, Article 24 in that charter, and I can actually send you the text, email me, anyone who wants it afterwards, I can, I can send you this text. Um, they make no claim on Judea and Samaria, what they call the West Bank, or on the Gaza Strip. They explicitly state, Article 24 of the PLO National Charter of 1964 states, we make no territorial claim of sovereignty over the Hima area, the Gaza Strip, or the West Bank. Why did they write that in their national charter? Because at the time, in 1964, that land was in the hands of the Jordanians, and Gaza was in the hands of Egypt. That territory was not in Jewish hands. The Israelis, the Jews, didn't, didn't have that territory at that time. So when the PLO uh, came out and they were kind of invented and they made their charter, they didn't want to antagonize Jordan. They, they're all allies. So they said, we make no territorial claim on that land. That is in the Palestinian National Charter of 1964, Article 24. Actually, the modern PLO charter, that article has mysteriously disappeared. If you Google the new PLO charter, it is identical to the 1964 one, except for one article. Can you guess which one? Article 24 has magically disappeared. And they now don't say that they make no more territorial claim because they do. Because now, who owns it? The Jews own it now. So we can see kind of uh, the, the motives behind that, that clause. Very good question. Um, Pam's asking, when did you make Aliyah? I know it was recent. And where do you give your lectures? So I made Aliyah 10 months ago from Canada, thank God, in the middle of Corona, best decision of my life. And uh, I give my lectures mostly, well now because of Corona for the last year, I'm giving them online mostly. But before that, in the world before COVID, um, I used to give them at the universities all over North America, uh, the states and in Canada mostly, also some here in Israel, mostly the states in Canada. We went to universities and we spoke to different organizations, students, clubs, Hopefully uh, we're getting through, you know, it's so important to educate them, the younger generation about the importance of Zionism and Israeli history and the facts on the ground. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm glad you attended the lecture. Pamela, I don't know who you are, but I'm so glad you attended. Pam is actually in uh, Tel Aviv. She, Pam lives in Tel Aviv and she used to, what was your official title, Pam? I mute yourself. Like program director, what what were you? She was something with with uh, Sarel. She's basically everybody knows. I was, I was the program coordinator for Sarel. She I was made, the, I she was the queen, years. actually. Seventeen years for seventeen oh, years. Right. There you Amazing. go. Amazing. But anyway, welcome, Lauren. You're doing a, just wonderful. So I'm going to follow you from now on to find out what you're doing here in Israel. <laughs> So <laughs> we need people so like you. Amazing. Thank you. And I, I, I love Sarel. I was uh, telling Ilana uh, last time, my mom uh, volunteered with Sarel for a year when she was my age. Uh, so mm. that was a, a while ago. But um, yeah, it, it's amazing. So I have huge respect for what you guys do. It's phenomenal. Yeah, we found out that we had much in common in the way of what our organizations stand for when I first met Lauren. So it was like a perfect <laughs> fit. Um, next question is from Bob. He said, no matter what the legality, someone who's being displaced from somewhere they have lived for 70 years is do something, not only empathy. What can Israel do to try to make a win-win, lose-lose result? 
well, hopefully it's not a lose lose. Yeah, result. I would hope it'd be win win. <laughs> <laughs> a win win. Um, so I I assume you're referring to Sheikh Jara that situation. Yes, I think he um, is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, as we say, and I think uh, as Julia was saying, she totally disagrees with my assessment of the situation there, and that's totally fine. That's okay. We can completely disagree. No problem. Uh, I think that's a, a personal thing. When you say they deserve something more than empathy, I, I, I agree with you. You know, we're all humans and no one deserves to be necessarily kicked out of their homes. However, there are factors at play here. We can't be reductionistic about what's going on, meaning we can't just say simply a family who's lived in an area for 70 years is being kicked out of their home because there are other factors involved here, namely the fact that they weren't paying rent for 70 years. So someone owns the land. Um, Okay, and they don't have the title deed to the land. For example, uh, someone else holds the title deed to the land. So what happens when that legal owner wants to come back? We have to, should we have empathy for them as well or not? Maybe them coming back right now is, is uh, not the right way to go about it. But again, there are so many ways to look at the situation. I wouldn't say it's just black and white. We can't kick someone out of their home after 70 years. I would say there are legitimate claims on both sides. But the only way to solve this is civilly and legally, which is what's been going on. They've been doing it through the Israeli courts, which I think is the most humane and mature approach to go about it. How el what else are we supposed to do? Have a stand up screaming act, throw rockets at each other? Hopefully not. Uh, usually Israelis who have a lot of disputes, they take it to the courts and that's great. I hope they do settle it civilly, peacefully in court. I hope everyone gets what they want. And if the families wanna stay there, I hope they start paying rent and stay there legally. And if not, uh, I hope they move to somewhere else. Keep in mind, I just want to uh, say that in the media, it's a huge thing about Sheikh Jarrah. Oh my God, they're being evicted and they're making it seem like we're ethnically cleansing the Palestinians or something, God forbid, from the area. We're not. There are hundreds of Palestinian homes there, thousands of Palestinian residents who live there. This is four families, only four families. The rest of the Arabs and Palestinians are being left alone. They're still living there perfectly peacefully. Um, it's just four families that are under dispute because of this rental and the title deed situation. Uh, so it's just, you know, something to keep in mind and have perspective that it's not like this terrible thing. Israel's like rolling tanks in and kicking them out of their houses. It's not like that at all. It's in court and I hope it gets solved peacefully in court. Could um, I just say, could I just say something? Ahead. If anybody wants background, or like a, a long, long, not long, but a, a good explanation of this. Um, Honest Reporting did a wonderful article um, May 9th, giving the whole background of the whole thing of the, of could the you, whole thing. Could you put a link of that uh, in the chat, Pam? Is that possible? Yeah, I'll try. Because that kind of ties I, into what I <laughs> or said it to me or something. That's uh, yeah. Great. I was actually going to ask Lauren. Oh, sorry, Pam, you're not done? No, because I, it was something that you said, Lauren, that is in this article, and that I didn't know either. Um, the fact is that they haven't been paying rent. They, they've been living there for free. I mean, it's all this time. And people don't know that. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to put this whole thing. Hey, guys, I gonna... there is something really important to keep in mind, you know, something much more general rather than the situation in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, if we go back in history to early 50s, so there was a law regarding the uh, property which was abandoned by the Arabs who left their homes during the war. And there is an Israeli law according to which the person who left his property and was not there at a given time, loses his right of property. This is the Israeli law and therefore all the houses which belong to the Arabs in Jerusalem, in Jaffa, in Haifa, etc., etc., they, they started belonging to the government and then it was sold to JNF, but this is a, a different story. The bottom line is that the Israeli law states that an Arab who lost his home back in 1948 lost it forever and will live there in these homes, okay, in Enkare and in, uh, you know, you name it, all over Israel. While a Jew who lost his home in Sheikh Jarrah or uh, the Muslim quarter of the old city, etc., he has to write, he has the right of, of uh, property. In other words, the Jews are living in Arab homes for 73 years, but these Arab families who are not paying rent during the same period of time, they have to be evicted forcefully. And on top of all, Ben Gvir, the one who just moved to, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to Sheikh Jarrah, 
As far as I understand, he does not own a house in Sheikh Jarrah. He simply moved there because he wanted to open an office. Pardon? He wanted to open an office. Oh, there. because he wanted to piss the Arabs off. This is the only reason. And as far as, well, I have to say that I believe that it's not an excuse. I believe that I'm sitting here waiting for the rockets to come because of what happened in Sheikh Jarrah. Yes, and I believe it happened because of Benville, and I believe it because it happened, back to your question, Steve, because, uh, you know, we are trying to form a government here, and it seemed two days ago, it seemed like it might be not the right wing oriented government and so hey we have rockets there is no way to form a government this is my understanding of the situation i can be totally wrong okay i don't know but the situation is not because of the four families it's because of the israeli law according to which an arab loss of property is not equal to a jewish loss of property that's it okay, okay. okay. But, but the one other thing both for lauren and for julia because um this is just things that I've heard and read. What about, oh, there's Ina at the airport. Hey, Ina, um, you are uh, in the airport? Yes, oh yes, I just want to say one more to say hello. Hi. I'm at the airport and we are flying to Tel Aviv. Well, I just heard the airport is closed. The airport is closed. Ina, Ina, Bruchim Habaim, it's Ida. Ina, Ina it's Ida. It's Ida, Bruchim Habaim. My <laughs> He's in the airport in New York. In New, yeah, York, New York, New York, yeah, right. Tell the pilot, tell the pilot to fly slowly because <laughs> right now Ben Gurion is closed. So hopefully by tomorrow morning when you arrive, it'll be open. But don't worry, Ina, your food will be in your apartment. So somebody, <laughs> thank you. Somebody told. By the way, now it's Mincha. They are praying. So somebody told me what a time to do Aliyah. I said maybe it's a very special time. It is. It so, is. but uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, we, let's hope for the best. So, Ina, take care. Bye. Bye. Take care. Hello, Hello. I just want to ask the two last questions, and people are saying, can we please <laughs> keep? Uh, keep Lauren here as, as uh, the speaker is speaking, but um, there's a question um, that I have is, you know, we know that so much of the news in America and elsewhere is incorrect and targets Israel. Um, what would you say is the most, is it honest reporting? Like where is the place you should go for the most honest reporting in your eyes? Most honest reporting. Okay, that, that's a good question. So first of all, on that topic, I just posted a link here. Uh, which, uh, it also is a great article. It's a friend of mine who's in Herut, and he wrote an op-ed about the history of Sheikh Jarrah and how it kind of exemplifies the Arab-Israeli conflict. Very interesting. I hope you guys read it. Um, but for a good uh, reading, honestly, to get a good um, understanding of every situation, you got to read paper that is pro and against. We never advise people only to read pro-Israel material because that would be a mistake. In order to um, understand it, to beat the enemy, you have to know the enemy. And uh, I read Al Jazeera a lot. And I read uh, these terrible organizations that are, are very anti-Semitic and anti-Israel in order to get a, a big picture. But if you want to go with uh, good reporting, I mean, the Jewish Journal sometimes has good stuff. Israel Hayom has good stuff. The Times of Israel uh, sometimes gives... Uh, depending on who's writing. You know, it's a difficult question because depending on which person is writing, different people write different types of articles. Um, right. some, some people are, are very pro-Israel, some are very anti-Israel, some don't give a good picture. It honestly, you should keep up with uh, writers and authors that you enjoy, um, that you find and follow them because some of them write for different papers as well. Like someone might write for Haaretz, uh, an op-ed piece and, and whatever. But I would say generally read a wealth of Israeli news, uh, a whole variety from left to right on the spectrum. In Israel, you'll get a fairly good you know, grasp of what's going on. The papers outside of Israel, like the New York Times, I would highly recommend you run, turn around and run as fast as you can in the other direction. Run like you're on fire. Yeah. I would not read stuff like that. But in Israel, read left to right, you know, all the papers, because then you'll get kind of an understanding that you can form in your own head. Okay, I kind of saw some bias on this side. I kind of saw some bias on this side. I'm getting a picture of what's going on. That's right. what I would recommend. There's only one last question I'll ask, and it's, 
Uh, Esther was asking, has Lauren heard of Solomon Ben Zimra's The Jewish People's Right to the Land of Israel? Have I heard of it? Of course, we teach it at some of our seminars. It's amazing. Uh, it's uh, my friend uh, Goldie Steiner, who runs uh, CILR in Canada, which is an amazing organization, works closely with Im Tirtzu. I don't know if you know the organization. Mm -hmm. And right. they put out that book. It's like their main book that they uh, educate. And it's a brilliant synopsis of the Jewish people's rights to the land of Israel. Very simple, a little more... Um, a little more legal in, in the jargon. It, you might have to read it twice or three times to get the understanding, but it's a brilliant book and I would highly, highly recommend everyone gets it. Actually, when we, I usually have a reading list that I suggest to people at the end of my talks that they should read. That's always on the list. Great. And I forgot to ask Larry's question, which is, do you, uh, have you taught this to Israeli high school students? Have you given this talk? Yes, we have, um, but not this year. We gave this uh, two years ago and last year. But now we haven't been in Israeli high school, unfortunately, since COVID started. And it's a little harder to get Israeli high schools on the Zoom. Um, but uh, yeah, we have given it and thank God, hopefully you got to start young. It's never too young to start learning about the history of Israel and, and the legal rights and the importance of Zionism. It should be the part of the, uh, the curriculum, I think. Yeah. To hear Agreed. 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 This is an extremely contemporary subject to the second. If you have any supplemental materials that you think might be of value to our audience of, of folks, in, in, and our audience, by the way, is worldwide, then uh, if you forward that to me, I will include it in the next general announcement, and so will Ilana, just as a, in, as a, a clickable kind of thing, and uh, people can go read it at their leisure. Absolutely. I can send you some reading materials, some flyers, and, and the informational pamphlets we give out when we talk. Um, and I can send you that flyer I had up on the screen with the Great. legal rights. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'll email it to either Ilana or Julia. Yeah, and send it to me. Fine. Send, send to Ilana. That'd be perfect. And we'll figure out a way to put it out there so people can click on it and go read on their own. But uh, excellent. Uh, uh, she, people keep asking for these links that you've already provided. Um, just one thing. Link to the colleague's article. That's that's was, above Tamar. There she it, it, it again. Too, I just have to click copy paste. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, people are asking. I, I would email Lauren if you have questions about getting uh, some of her slides. She put her information okay. in, but I think she's going to put it in again. I'll put it in again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. And, and, we, any and, we, and we can include all that in one bundle when yeah. we send out our uh, our email, which goes out uh, on Friday concerning next week's right. episodes. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. I have another question. Yes, um, yes. Lauren doesn't, or Julia or Lauren, um, the postponement of the elections, um, didn't that also, uh, you know, like start some of the problems with the, everything that went on? You're talking about the postponement of the Palestinian elections? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so so background on that. Uh, yeah. Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen is the Palestinian Authority president, and he has been the Palestinian Authority president <laughs> for 16 years now. He's 16 years into a four-year term. So uh, <laughs> clearly, he's not a democratic president. He's a dictatorial, theocratic leader who refuses to leave, unfortunately for the Palestinian people, because he's very bad for them, I do believe, and he's very oppressive. Um, anyway, they were supposed to finally have Palestinian Authority elections right now, and surprise, surprise, Mahmoud Abbas canceled them at the last minute, um, because he said, you know, the Sheikh Jarrah stuff going on, and focus on the violence, and he's, you know, calling everyone to have more violence and whatever, so again, he's using that as a pretext to cancel the elections. In my opinion, they were never going to happen anyway, not in a million years. Actually, when a couple months ago, when that guy came out and said he was running against Mahmoud Abbas. Remember, he mysteriously dropped out five minutes later, uh, and there was no one running to contend Mahmoud Abbas. The whole election, it's a farce. It's never going to happen because it's not a democratic place. And I don't believe that that caused necessarily any violence because the way we're seeing the violence is directed at the Israelis and at the Jews. It's not directed at the other Arabs. It's not directed at the government. Unfortunately, they're not rising up and saying, we, we demand democratic elections. They're having violence at the Jews. So I don't think that was 
a precursor to anything. It may have contributed. Listen, there's a lot of stuff going on right now that may contribute it. You've got Jerusalem Day. You've got Ramadan. You've got Nakba Day coming up. You've got the Sheikh Jarrah uh, evictions. And now you've got the canceled Palestinian elections. All these things could be little sparks adding to the major fire. Um, but I think the fire is ideological in nature and not necessarily a result of this particular cancellation of elections. Thank you. I'm hearing from, I heard from Pam. Pam, you said four people have been injured in Tel Aviv. One, so one person was killed in Tel Aviv. Another person yeah. was killed. Already? Can I yes. say something, please? Because we've heard your opinion over and over. My opinion is we need a two-state solution. We have got to negotiate with the Palestinians. We can't evict them from ancestral homes. How can we expect them to pay rent when they haven't for seven generations, they can't find jobs because their economy is a mess. We've got to get them vaccinated and hopefully we'll soon be able to return in person to volunteers for Israel, okay? And good luck with your Aliyah, Mazel Tov. Thank you, thank well, you, thank I, you. Uh, I must say uh, that I totally agree with Rena, uh, exactly what you said, Rena. This is my opinion as well. And of course, uh, as uh, Lauren uh, mentioned before, we it's okay for us to disagree. And yes, we, we disagree. And uh, Pamela, since you asked both uh, Lauren and me what we think about uh, the connection between the elections and the rockets. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with Lauren that uh, I think um, uh, the, the cancellation of the Palestinian election may have contributed, but this is not the major thing. I believe that uh, the situation with the lack of government in Israel is the major reason for whatever is going on now, because we had Ramadan and we had Palestinians and we had tensions and we have unhappy Palestinians and this and this and that for, for many years. And I really don't think that this is a coincidence that right now we have... Uh, the rockets and the riots, and we had demonstrations last night and uh, uh, a traffic light uh, right next to my house, which is also next to a, mm -hmm. a, a, an Arab, Israeli Arab town, was burned and ruined, and we have so much violence going on all over Israel. Uh, and obviously there's no, no excuse for violations and there's no excuse for aggression. And uh, I hope the police will, will make it tonight uh, unlike they did last night and, and yesterday. Uh, but I think the whole thing was caused by uh, our elections uh, rather than the Palestinian elections. I didn't, mean it, I didn't mean that it was a main factor. I just meant that it added to yes. so much more of the unrest. Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah, of course. The Palestinians are unhappy and now they are even more unhappy. Right. Sure. And the, la the last thing I heard on television, you know, the Pal Palestinians might be horrible fighters, always starting wars and losing them, but they're great at public relations. I heard a Palestinian woman on television crying and sobbing and blaming our wonderful president, Joe Biden, to intervene, to interfere and prevent him from getting kicked out of their ancestral homes. <laughs> and that breaks my heart because he's not really prepared to do that. He does, I don't know that he knows how to do that. And he's going to have to step up to bat and stop this violence. It's his job now. I voted for him. I want him to stop the violence. And I don't know that he knows how. I think we should he turn was, this back to Lauren to, yeah, we you know, elect him as the Israeli prime minister. Like, yeah. Lauren, do you have anything to say that you want to uh, kind of end with or to respond? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I thank everyone for their comments. Any responses I give right now, obviously are not uh, based in any fact. They're simply my opinions. And uh, as uh, Julia and I said, it's okay if we disagree on stuff. That's totally fine. Listen, we're, we're Jews. If we don't have a million opinions uh, between uh, this group of us, then we're not real Jews, right? So, of course, we're we both agree that Israel needs a successful tourist season this summer. They need the tourists. We need yes. 
we can we can definitely agree that yes, please God, the tourism comes back and the economy gets booming. But Israel is doing wonderful, actually. Thank God we are coming out of Corona and uh, things are pretty much open here, which is amazing. And we just need the rockets to stop. Uh, with regard to foreign aid and foreign support, I'm not going to uh, tell you whether I love Joe Biden or whether I love Trump or whatever, but I will say that uh, our allies have a responsibility to our country not to provide our enemies with aid. I'll say that's a moral obligation and uh, should foreign uh, countries pay, uh, send money, for example, to the Palestinian governments, I think in part the rockets falling, they have blood on their hands. So I think we need to demand as Israelis and as Jews that our allies stand with us, stand with our government, stand with safety. And uh, that's, that's what I'll say about that. America can say to Israel, tons of it, wheelbarrows of it. All right. The rockets have to stop falling to get Americans to go to Tel Aviv. I, I, I agree. We do get uh, lots of foreign aid. Unfortunately, uh, Joe Biden did just send a hefty paycheck to the Palestinian government uh, mm -hmm. once he got elected. And uh, I do believe that was the wrong thing to do because guess what? That aid just landed in Israel. It landed in Israel this morning and it landed in Israel last night. And my rocket alarm is telling me that it's landing in Israel as we speak. So I don't, I don't, believe, I don't believe that aid was actually sent to Israel that's subject to legal dispute. That's perfectly okay if we, if we disagree. I also think it is incumbent on our foreign allies to stand up and unequivocally condemn what is going on here sure. and make strong statements on social media and come out and say the rockets are unacceptable. If they don't do that, you know, I don't know how we can feel confident sure. in their alliance. We need them to stand up with what's right. Sure, um, yeah. And as I, and I never quote my rabbi, but I do say this one thing. He said it's not a different it's not about right and wrong it's not a difference between right and wrong right and left it's a difference between right and wrong which is what uh, he, I like that. that's, yeah. that's why I'm I not like a that. Yeah. all right well thank you so much Lauren I'm sorry before um before we hang up I'm sorry I missed most of your presentation Lauren but I sent you a note it was actually sent to everyone and I would really love I see it and Pam Lazarus responded already I missed a lot of the presentation. I'd like to hear a recording if it was being recorded. Yes. Yes, so I need that link, but I also want to stay in touch with, um, with Lauren because I'm coming on a VFI, God willing, uh, trip in November. And um, I'm seriously considering making Aliyah in the next couple of years. I'm finally in a position to do it. I don't care how old I get. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm an effective advocate when I decide that I like to, uh, that, you know, put my energies behind this cause. And Israel is very, very dear to me. That's, right. that's amazing. Well, I, I'll say, I just took a picture of your uh, email. We'll definitely stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish you luck in your decision. And I hope you come to Israel. Of course, I'm a little biased, but I would encourage Aliyah. And uh, <laughs> you know what? There's no such thing. I have no idea how old you are. Don't tell me, but there's no such thing as being too old. I'll tell you right now. My mom just made Aliyah one month ago and she's here now. Thank God. Right. Uh, which is Thank amazing. God. That is so exciting. I'll be yeah, 64 okay. in July. You're not old. Amazing. No, amazing. no amazing. I've got 25 more years than me. I know. Bring chicken. Um, <laughs> you, got, you, got, you got 45 years, Bezrat Hashem. And guess what? My friend just made Aliyah two weeks ago, and he came with his mom and his 98-year-old grandma. <gasps> Wonderful. So they, they wrote an article about her in uh, the Times of Israel, 98, and she just made Aliyah. So there's no such thing as too old. That is wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay, great. I'm glad we're going to stay in touch. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and uh, Pam, Pamela, did you yes. saw my email. Please reach out. Send me an email uh, as well. Um, okay. okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I don't want to hijack this anything. Was, I'm sorry. This was wonderful. All right. Well, um, thank you so much. Let's, let's, I, I think we should talk about um, our next programs coming up uh, Thursday yeah. and Tuesday. Yep. You want to mention? You want to yeah, Sure. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, we have to do a total switch. Actually, not a total one because uh, today we were talking about uh, the uh, Jewish rights over the land of Israel, which is uh, sort of a controversy here. And uh, next week, next Tuesday, we will be talking about who wrote the Bible. Okay, that sounds 
weird, maybe. And uh, Lauren, you just mentioned that you're an Orthodox Jew, so I think this is a bit of a problematic topic for you. Uh, but yes, I mean, um, yeah, so it will be more of a scientific uh, approach, more uh, sort of a research approach to who wrote the Bible. In other words, how was the Bible, the Tanakh, uh, formed? So this is the presentation for next week. And the day after tomorrow, uh, which is uh, Thursday, we will be talking about another, well, sort of a controversial topic, but not that difficult, okay? Because we don't really care. Okay, we will be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We will be talking about the most amazing find of uh, the 20th century, uh, the most ancient fragments of the Bible ever found. I mean, the most ancient biblical texts we have in our hands now. And the controversy is about who actually wrote these texts. But we don't really care about that. I mean, you know, it happened 2,000 years ago anyhow. Uh, so the day after tomorrow, we have a presentation about the Dead Sea Scrolls found in Qumran. And then next week, we will be talking about the Bible and Tipori, which is a uh, beautiful national park with the most beautiful mosaics in Israel, which used to be uh, the hometown of Sanhedrin. And this is where the Mishnah was assembled. And so it has a great Jewish significance, and it's just very pretty. So that's it. Okay, that's it. Right. And then Bible, and then Tipori. Sorry. Right. To see a summary of future events going out to May 27th, you can tune into tinyurl.com slash VFI educates. We have listed everything else to the end of the month. And if you want to hear this presentation, this episode, uh, number 93, or any of the 92 preceding episodes, you can find a way to do with that at the same location, tinyurl.com slash VFI educates. All you have to do is click and take you right to the episode. Um, I, I can't imagine a more timely presentation in the prior 92, Lauren, than we've had today. This is the timing is amazing, and I just really hope that our next presentation two days from now is not done from a bomb shelter. Please, God. Please, so Thank God. you very much for your presentation today. It was very helpful for many of us to see sides and different sides, and all these talking points are kind of swimming around now, and they're all very healthy because I think we'll be talking about this little episode uh, for another month or two before it resolves out. Hopefully, uh, it finds an end without the world blowing up. So thank you very much again for joining us. At this time, we will enter schmooze mode, which you're all well, welcome to stick around uh, till you know five or six o'clock in the morning, uh, thank you. chatting about things. So thank you again. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You, thank you for providing us. Lauren, with thank you very Lauren. much. It was so stimulating and informative. So glad. Thanks, guys. See you all soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great speaker. Bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs> Wow, talk so fast. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Very enthusiastic. Very enthusiastic. Julia, thank you. You are uh, welcome. Uh, what for? <laughs> <laughs> Just for, for being here, being consistent, um, yeah. for, oh, your, for your yeah, thank advocacy, you. your ruach that you bring to us and uh, all the all the learning. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It, it is yeah. very welcome, and I thank you for it. What did Demarca so think much. about today's Thank presentation? You warm words. Linda, Thank Linda's you. asking what's happening now in Israel, rockets, sirens wise. And real yeah, exactly yeah. this. Rockets and sirens and uh, and demonstrations and uh, stones are being thrown around and uh, well, we we have a very active night. Not not uh, the type of you know activity we would like to have, but that's what we have. It, it's the people right now. I just got a uh, a little uh, video of. It looks like, well, it actually looks amazing. I will try to share it with you now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have a woman killed in Rishon LeZion right mm -hmm. now from a direct mm -hmm. rocket fall. Ooh. And a 18, 18 people uh, wounded, and we had rockets uh, hit by uh, the Iron Dome above um, uh, Ben Gurion Airport. And a pipeline in Ashkelon was hit, and there's a big fire there. Mm. You know, they've had yeah. some sort of peace for seven years. None of this. You know, for Americans oh, to think about. Lots of people in Pennsylvania and watching rockets fly over from New Jersey is unthinkable. 
and yet it's almost a normal course of duty in Israel. Yeah. Okay, uh, guys, I will try to make you see that. I don't know if you can. <clears throat> can you see this? Can you yes. see that? Oh, boy. Yes. Right. yes. Okay. Holy That's Michael. about an hour old video. Okay, this video was taken about an hour ago uh, in yeah. Ashdod. This looks like rockets being intercepted. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Right. Yeah, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of success to the Iron Dome, of course, but uh, wow. that's what people saw from their windows. Wow. Where are they Very getting exciting. all of this? Where are they getting all of this hardware from? Is it Iran that's supplying all of those rockets? Uh, we don't really know. I mean, not officially, but but probably the answer is yes. I mean, it's uh, supplied by Iran to uh, Egypt, and then it smuggled through the tunnels from Egypt uh, across the border into Gaza. But that's not like official in information. This is what. Uh, I thought Gaza. I thought Gaza was making some of its own rockets too, with materials that they've had brought in. Yeah, uh, pro yeah, heard... some of it, but not the most sophisticated. I mean, as far as again, you know, as a civilian, I don't know much, but as far as we know, as civilians, as far as we are told by you know the media, uh, they don't have the technical ability to make rockets which will make all the way from Gaza to Tel Aviv. So, um, but but I don't really know. Troya, is there any chance that Netanyahu won't run again? Pardon? Any chance that Netanyahu might not run again? No. Oh, I don't think, at least I, I don't think so. I, I cannot see such a uh, situation. I mean, uh, right now, you, well, you know, he, he gave the mandate back and now the mandate was given to uh, Yair Lapid and Yair Lapid was trying to form a coalition with Bennett, uh, who is right-wing uh, religious, but not like ultra-Orthodox. Uh, and they needed the support of uh, of Mansour Abbas, uh, who is a uh, Islamic. He he has a Muslim, is very uh, Islamic party, and they were supposed to have the final negotiations uh, two days ago, and then it did not happen because the rockets started falling. And then uh, Mansour Abbas, who is Arab Muslim, he cannot actually you know make any agreements with the Jews. Well, now we have this escalation, and now everything is frozen. Uh, now, uh, Yair Lapid has 28 days. Now he has 21 days left. And so if he will not form a coalition within 21 days, so we will have another election. And then Bibi will run again for uh, the position of the prime minister, um, just, you know, all over again. And uh, basically, he, uh, the, you know, right now when we have all, all this situation, uh, Quite a few people tend to support the right wing rather than the left wing. Uh, so we, we back to where we were. Uh, to echo something Steve said, this is really a time when a lot of us would be going to Israel to volunteer right now. And I, and I wish we could. Um, hopefully soon. We are, you know, people are starting to fill out their applications. So as soon as we can, we can, we can go over and help. By the way, I can see uh, Betsy just asked, have additional folks uh, been called up for Miluim? So yeah, the answer is yes. We had uh, an emergency uh, call for eight uh, Miluim units of the border police now. And uh, Sharona, you all know her, uh, she was guiding a tour today. And then in the middle of the tour, one of the men said, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, I have to go. Uh, I got a call, it's called the uh, Tavshmone, like the, uh, the emergency call. So he just left in the middle of um, mm. the tour and, um, and, and drove home. So yes, uh, the answer is yes. And now what we are actually uh, waiting for, and, and we are terrified by the thought, but that's something, you know, we, we're waiting for that. Right now we have only bombing of Gaza, but within a day or two, if nothing will calm down, so we will have another probably, you know, uh, overland invasion into Gaza, and then we will have more casualties, we will have battles, we will have more uh, wounded soldiers, and, you know, like, like we had in the previous operation. And there's uh, so that's it. What organization can we support uh, in helping people since we can't be there to assist in the logistics end of things? Uh, is there some kind of a group that, uh, or is Volunteers for Israel providing some kind of assistance? 
with people who live in Israel? Good question. Uh, you could, Sarel has um, the ability to accept donations directly from Americans. Uh, you might want to check out their website. They in turn have volunteers on bases now, as I understand it. And uh, the, the need for the volunteers is probably increasingly significant every single day more so. So I would say if you wanted to spend some money, the only organization I could suggest that might be directly attached to uh, warfare type things, it would be Sarel, sarel.org. Thank you, Steve. That's what I wanted to know. Okay. I mean, there's right. other there's other places what? like Yasha Lachayel and other oh, yeah. the, that like help support lone soldiers and things like that. You have to be right. careful because not all of it goes directly to the, the soldiers. Sarel money isn't going to help other people. So it's just right. going for overhead for Sarel. Yeah. Right. So. Julia, when was the yeah. last time that the Gaza Strip was um, invaded? Um, what that, was the, yeah, that was the last operation which took place. It was well, 10 years ago? Sure, maybe four years ago, I guess. Just four? Uh, can somebody Google it? I don't remember. It happens very, uh, very often. I, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, Ilana, are you Googling it? No, no I'm, I'm uh, feeling people in the chat. I'm, I'm too busy. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I will Google it or somebody else will Google it. Uh, I don't remember, but it was not long ago. Uh, I thought yeah, it was the Debbie, last time that I was there, but you know, four years ago is not the last time. Debbie had a good idea of donating to Magenda Vida Dome. Oh, right. Not a bad idea. Yeah. That's a also, the car, I guess, too. Gail, did you hear me, Gail? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. What about Zaka? I don't know that one. Zaka is uh, the oh, religious Zaka. organization Zaka. that uh, helps uh, in case of, uh, you know, bombings and things like that. They clean up. Okay. Right. They take the body parts. And I probably, yeah, I would probably do my Gendavita Dome now. Maybe I'll do that. Good point. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. I have to go, go now. Thanks. All right, everyone. Enjoy your evenings. Hey, so, yeah. Yeah. Where you yeah. are. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Have a okay. good night, Julia. Yeah. Good night. See you the day after tomorrow. Oh, Be safe. Bye. All right. <laughs> Goodbye. We're okay. We're in schmooze mode. Yeah. Harry just said um, the, um, where was it? 2008 was the last time there was a major military ca uh, cast lead, right? Yeah, I had one so of that's, uh, friends was So that's quite a bit of time ago. Uh, no, I just found it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we, have the iron, uh, we have the Iron Dome 2014, yeah. which is yet, uh, yeah, but still that's seven years ago, not like four. Uh, you see, I remember it so recently because it was so uh, so stressful and so uh, traumatic for right. us. So it feels like it was yesterday. I thought yeah. four years. Yeah. I just saw Julia. Did, yeah. uh, did Malka enjoy today's lecture? Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, she is she is right here. I'm not sure what are her political views and understandings. Uh, we, we won't know because she has no mouth again. <laughs> <laughs> True. I didn't, fix, I, I didn't fix it yet. I don't know, but I hope she has a broad enough, you know, understanding and... Uh, 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 yeah, she, she hears everything what's going on here, so she knows so much. She, she does have big ears. His ears. Just um, <laughs> That's good. Right. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she, will be, she will be taken to the bomb shelter in case of emergency. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah. I'm talking to two okay. family members in bomb shelters right now. So. <laughs> oh, how are they doing? <laughs> They're okay. They say every time they tried to come out, the, the siren would go off again in Tel, Where are they? Tel Aviv. So they, uh, so they were just staying down there. Amazing. Well, in such a case, I will say uh, an official good night to all of you. And I will call my cousin in Rishon Le Sion and yeah. uh, have a good, safe night. Okay, you too.